At 23, I was on the hunt for a studio apartment to rent. Fresh out of college, I had next to no money, barely scraping by on a bit more than minimum wage. My primary focus was finding the cheapest possible option available. Initially, I searched for both one-bedroom apartments and studios. However, as the weeks went by, it became increasingly clear that those options were simply not financially feasible. Reluctantly, I turned to Craigslist, despite its less than stellar reputation. One of my friends had a positive experience and recommended it, so I decided to give it a shot. On the first day of browsing Craigslist, I didn't come across anything suitable, though the sheer volume of listings gave me a glimmer of hope. Unfortunately, none of them matched my location or price requirements. It was around the third or fourth day of searching that I stumbled upon a new listing that caught my attention. Located a few miles away, it was for a studio in a small apartment building. Despite the low quality, pixelated pictures, I decided to investigate further, intrigued by the promising details. I reached out to the owner, who responded promptly, and we arranged a tour for later that evening at 7. In our brief exchange, nothing struck me as out of the ordinary about the owner. His messages were professional, and he appeared eager to show me the place. A couple of hours later, I got into my car and started driving over to the address he sent me. It's worth noting that I was aware beforehand that this wasn't a particularly nice area of our city, but it was the most affordable. Honestly, I didn't think it was too bad, although looking back, perhaps I was just being naive because it seemed like my only option. Upon arriving, I pulled up to a rather old-looking apartment building. Parking on the side of the street, I texted the man to let him know I had arrived, then proceeded to walk up to the front door. Not spotting the man anywhere, I buzzed the room and waited for a few seconds before the door unlocked. Stepping inside, I was greeted by a staircase in the middle and two rooms on either side. Before I could even glance at the room numbers, a voice echoed from somewhere above the staircase, informing me that they were on the third floor. Assuming the man was addressing me, I began ascending the stairs. However, I couldn't shake the growing sense of unease at his absence from the door, especially considering how professional he had been in our text exchanges. Upon reaching the top of the steps, I found myself in a small hallway with two doors, one of which was open. I walked over and peered inside, only to find a man standing a few feet away, looking back at me. He greeted me warmly, shook my hand, and invited me inside. Yet my confusion was immediate. The place was clearly inhabited, with a couch, TV, chairs, and even food on the counters. It was unmistakably lived in. Does someone else live here? I asked kindly. The man quickly replied with a short laugh and said, no one lived here and everything would be gone by tomorrow. I smiled and said, okay though that response didn't sit right with me. He started leading me further in, pointing out features of the place, but it suddenly dawned on me that this wasn't even a studio. There were multiple doors surely leading to other rooms. This was at least a one or two bedroom apartment, and there was no way the price could be what he said it was. It seemed like he noticed my suspicions as he stopped what he was saying and moved toward the hallway. He opened one of the doors that clearly led to a bedroom and started telling me to take a look inside. But before I could answer, we were interrupted when my phone chimed. I pulled it out of my pocket and checked who it was. My face went pale, seeing it was from the man from Craigslist asking where I was. I looked up in horror, realizing what had happened, and I could tell that whoever this guy was in front of me knew that I'd figured it out. This terrifying moment passed, and the guy didn't move or say anything. He just stood and looked at me with a blank stare. After a moment, I hurried out of there and down the stairs, not hearing the guy follow. I got in my car and left, feeling horrified. I never even texted the actual man back as I was no longer interested in staying anywhere near that place. And I didn't know if maybe he was in on it too, somehow. But whoever that guy was who lured me into his home was so close to being able to probably abduct me. I don't know. And I don't even want to know, but I never opened Craigslist again after that night. I was on Craigslist for the first time in probably five years I thought to myself, realizing I'd forgotten about the site. I'd never had any need or use for it and hadn't really heard about it lately. But due to my moving situation, I needed to get rid of a bunch of random things. I initially called a junk removal company hoping they would just take everything. However, their estimate was over $400 for getting rid of just a couple of things. That's when I turned to Craigslist. I put up a listing for free stuff and included pictures of all the things I was giving away. 
Maybe I just didn't understand how it works nowadays, but I thought I'd get a lot of responses from people wanting to pick up free stuff. However, I barely got any, and the ones that did respond to the listing ended up ghosting me after a couple of texts. Then, about a week after making the listing, a man who introduced himself as KJ reached out. He said he wanted to pick up my couch and was flexible about the day. I really thought this was going to be the same as all the other people who had reached out, so I didn't put much effort into getting him to actually come pick up the couch. I let him know that I worked between 9 and 5, so if he wanted to pick it up, he could just let me know. Again, I didn't think he'd actually come. But sure enough, in the morning before work, he sent me a text saying he'd like to swing by tonight. I told him that was great, I said, expressing my approval. As I left work that night, I sent him my address. The drive home was only about 20 minutes, but I hoped he would come sooner rather than later because I didn't want to waste my night waiting for him. So if he didn't end up showing, I could do something else. When I pulled into my driveway, a car was parked on the curb right next to my house, but nobody was in it. It was the only car parked on the whole street, so it seemed clear that they were at my house. Thinking it was KJ, I quickly got out and ran to my front door, but he wasn't there. It crossed my mind that this could be just some crazy coincidence, and the car might be for someone else's house, but I wasn't convinced. I got inside and sent a text to KJ asking what his ETA was. Then I stood by the window and looked outside. After 10 or so minutes, I still hadn't gotten a response, and I didn't see anyone outside either. So I calmed myself down and turned away from the window. I went to the kitchen, pouring myself a drink and just standing there when a small thud sounded from upstairs. Unaware of what it was, I put my drink down and listened. There were a few seconds of silence. Then suddenly, heavy footsteps were running down the stairs. I was so caught off guard. I just stood where I was and stared down the hallway as a man appeared at the other end, running right to the front door. He swung it open and ran out. And when I made it to the front, he was already driving away in that car that was parked on the curb. I was still stunned, trying to process what happened, because it was all so sudden and quick. Eventually, I got my phone out and called the police, then tried calling KJ, but he didn't pick up, which meant to me that it was definitely him who had broken in. When the police investigated, they found that KJ's phone wasn't registered to a name or address. So we were back to square one. Nothing ever did come of it, despite me trying multiple times to get the police back on the case. As far as I know, nothing was stolen. So maybe he didn't have enough time or he was waiting for me. Maybe that thud I heard was him accidentally giving himself away. So he took his chance to run now that he didn't have the element of surprise on me. But whatever really happened, all I can do is hope that he never comes back. That night changed everything. Now every shadow holds their sinister secrets. In 2018, I experienced a divorce that left me with virtually nothing. I relocated to a small home, but it was empty. I lacked furniture, appliances, everything, really. The task of furnishing my place seemed daunting, particularly from a financial standpoint. So I saw this as an opportunity to find discounted items on Craigslist. My main focus was on big ticket items like a couch and a TV. Finding deals didn't prove difficult. I reached out to a few sellers and made some purchases. During this process, I came across a listing for a TV stand posted for $40. It looked like a typical wooden TV stand. The seller, Matt, however, had specific conditions for pickup. He insisted it had to be after nine on weekdays due to his work schedule, ruling out weekends entirely. While this arrangement still suited me, I found his strictness somewhat peculiar. I assumed this specificity was why the item hadn't been sold yet. I agreed to pick up the TV stand on a Wednesday at 9.30 p.m. On the appointed day, I confirmed with Matt and received his address. The town he lived in was unfamiliar to me, only mentioned in passing conversations. Soon I understood why. Most of the homes were dilapidated, with aging infrastructure. Even the street lights were mostly non-functional. Pulling up to Matt's house didn't ease my unease. It matched the rundown appearance of the surrounding homes, illuminated only by a dim hallway light. I counted out $40 and tucked the bills into my pocket before stepping out of my car and onto his porch. As I waited for him to answer the doorbell, I glanced around his yard. It was cluttered with various items, garden statues, eclectic decorations scattered about. The porch itself was adorned with knickknacks and oddities. Then he opened the door. Matt was a tall and skinnier looking man, 
Probably in his forties I observed, he wore a tired expression, as if he hadn't slept in days. As he welcomed me inside, I could smell booze on his breath. If I'd known beforehand that this was who I'd be buying from, I never even would have come here, I thought, but it was too late for that now. As we walked down the hall, stuff was scattered all around the house. It wasn't like a hoarder's home you'd see on TV, but more like an abandoned house that had been trashed by random teenagers. When we reached the living room in the back of the house, he pointed at the TV stand. The room was barely lit, making it hard to see the condition it was in. Any chance you could turn on the light for me, I asked politely. Matt didn't respond, but walked over to the wall and flicked on a small lamp in the corner. It was around this time that I got a really weird feeling that something was wrong. And before I even got to look at the TV stand, I heard someone else behind me. Another man had come around the corner, standing next to Matt. He didn't say hello or anything, just watched me. I was really unsure what to make of this and didn't want to overreact right away. But I was also getting really uncomfortable as that eerie feeling only grew larger. I was standing there trying to think of what to say or do, but then Matt walked past me and stood in front of the TV stand. They were now on either side of me, facing me and not speaking. Several long seconds passed as nobody spoke or moved. Before I quickly walked past the other guy and down the hallway toward the front door, I made a hasty exit. As I left, I heard them laughing in the room behind me, like this was funny. And as I got halfway to my car, the front doors slammed shut. I can't even find any reasons for what occurred that night or what those two guys were trying to do. Maybe it was just some sick joke they were pulling, trying to get me to freak out or maybe it was something more sinister. I don't plan on finding out though. It was May of last year and I had just signed a lease on a new house. It turns out the refrigerator was not the subject of a deal. I will spend most of my money on the house. So I started looking for a cheap one at garage sales. I haven't found any way this way. Therefore, I miss Craigslist. After only 10 minutes, a person appeared not far from me. I called the number and a nice woman answered. She said the refrigerator was still for sale but she couldn't guarantee it would still be there when I arrived. So against my better judgment, I asked him about PayPal and sent him $75. She sent me an email confirming that she had received the money and we set a date for me to pick it up. That Saturday I texted him to let him know I was on my way. The house was a beautiful ranch style house probably built in the 80s. I knocked on the door and this hot girl with brown hair and a very short haircut answered. After choosing field work, I asked her about Sunny, and she said it was her and took me inside. I have no reason to worry. Just like the outside, the house is well finished and smells clean. We chatted for a few minutes until a tall guy, at least six foot five, covered in tattoos, appeared from the kitchen. She introduced me as John, her boyfriend, and told me he was going to take me to the refrigerator. She disappeared behind the house, and I never saw her again. John led me through the kitchen to the garage door. He opened the door and pointed to the refrigerator. He was in front of me, almost sitting against the high door. I could barely see it because the garage was so dark. I asked him if he had a light, but he said it was broken and they hadn't had a chance to fix it. It's not serious. He had to open the high door so I couldn't get out. Anyway, I asked him to pick it up, but he said it was also broken. He apologized. I was just about to present it to the House of Commons. This upsets me, but I have no other choice, right now. There was a bit of light coming from inside the house. It must have done that. I took two, maybe three steps into the garage before realizing there was plastic on the floor. I looked down and saw it covering the entire floor. That's when I started to worry. I don't see any reason why I should be there, except that I would stop walking. John's shadow began to get closer. Then in the left corner, I heard shuffling. Everything in me speaks of leaving. Suddenly I turned around and quickly went back to open the door. I was surprised that John was so close to me, but I continued. I snuck up to him and said, ah, I left the stroller in the truck and I'll be right back. Not far away there was a cart leaning against the wall. He pointed at it and was about to say something but I didn't stop. When I was sure he was no longer behind me, I ran the rest of the way to my truck door. I jumped in and out of there. I don't know what happened after that. I received a few messages from Dawn, but posted them without reading them. When I got home, I logged on to Craigslist to report them. I was shocked to see that the list was gone. I looked around for another 30 minutes to make sure they deleted it immediately. I also called the police and reported it. They seemed a bit skeptical about my request, but promised to check. I never heard from them again, and I didn't care. I'm alive, and that's enough for me. 
For the $75, I have no chance of asking for a refund, and it's not worth getting involved with these monsters anymore. Since then I haven't gone there anymore. The whole system seems dangerous to me these days. Anyway, a week later I got lucky and a thrift store in my neighborhood had a used refrigerator. It cost $100, but it's much nicer than this one, and it serves its purpose very well. And in conclusion, I don't want to mislead people. I don't think Craigslist is dangerous, and it's free. Thousands of people collect their belongings every day without any problems. But after what happened to me, I don't think it's worth it. However, if you find anything on the site, just be careful. Bring a friend when picking them up if you can meet in a public place during the day. But more importantly, use your head in the situation may seem fuzzy and could be the difference between life and death. I am a man in my 30s hailing from a small town, and I have a chilling tale to share about my encounter with the unpredictable world of Craigslist. It all started when I decided to sell my US television set on the website. The TV was nothing extraordinary, just a modest entertainment center, but I thought it might catch someone's interest. Little did I know that the simple act would spiral into a horrifying ordeal that still sends shivers down my spine. The first sign of life from the other side of the screen was a message from a woman who seemed quite keen on the entertainment center. Hi there. I saw your TV listing. Is it still available? She messaged. We exchanged a few messages, and soon enough, we had arranged a time for her to come over and inspect the item. The plan seemed straightforward enough. We agreed on 7 o'clock and I made sure everything was ready for her visit. As the clock neared seven, I waited with anticipation. But as the minutes ticked by, there was no sign of her. Confused, I decided to text her to see if she was still planning to come. After what felt like an eternity, I finally received a response just when I was about to call it a night. So sorry. Can I still come over? She apologized. Being a night owl... I thought, why not? Let's give it a shot, even though it was already 10 p.m. As you can imagine, the 10 minutes she said she would take to get there turned into 20. I began to question whether I was wasting my time when another text message arrived. Just pulling up now, she messaged. My curiosity overcame me, even though she said she was just pulling up. A mixture of anticipation and caution filled me as I made my way to the front door. My heart skipped a beat as I approached the door. Not only was the woman there in my driveway, but her car also had four or five additional occupants. Who are they? I asked, feeling a knot in my stomach. They all want to see the entertainment center, the woman explained in a casual manner. I don't know about you, but having a bunch of strangers break into my house wasn't in the plan. I firmly informed her that only she could enter to check out the TV. I wasn't even sure I wanted her to enter my home at that point. I'm sorry, but I can't allow everyone in, I stated firmly. Despite her insistence, she might understand. So I told her no. I was surprised to see the woman lose her composure and become angry at my choice. This is ridiculous. You're not being very accommodating, she snapped. She had the goal to accuse me of not living up to my Christian obligations. Let me tell you, putting myself in danger wasn't part of being a good Christian. As you might imagine, I locked all the doors because I was uneasy and went inside my house for protection. With my heart racing, I couldn't help but glance out the window. One of the guys who was with her made the odd decision to relieve himself at the end of my driveway, which made things even more bizarre. It looked like a scene from a horror film throughout. They eventually got back in the car, and with a screech of tires, they all drove off into the night. I couldn't believe it. It was like a nightmare had abruptly ended when I considered what might have occurred if I had allowed them inside. I couldn't help but shudder. I learned a valuable lesson about using Craigslist to transact with strangers after that terrifying incident. I made sure to exercise extra caution and follow my gut instincts going forward. 
Simply put, you can never be sure who is lurking in the online world shadows on the other side of that screen. Therefore, keep my story in mind. If you ever find yourself selling something on Craigslist, be wary, establish boundaries, and resist pressure to jeopardize your safety. After all, it's preferable to be branded a bad Christian than to experience a real-life horror story. I was born and raised in a small town, a place where everyone knew everyone else, and life was simple and predictable. However, life had other plans for me, and I found myself moving to the big city, a place teeming with life, noise, and endless possibilities. The transition was not easy, and I had to make several adjustments to fit into my new environment. One of these adjustments involved selling my car, a reliable six-year-old Honda, a cord that had been my faithful companion through many adventures. The decision to sell my car was not an easy one. It was more than just a vehicle. It was a symbol of my past life, a life that was quickly fading into the background as I embraced the hustle and bustle of city life. However, I realized that owning a car in the city was more of a burden than a convenience. With public transportation readily available, and parking spaces hard to come by, I decided to let go of my beloved car. I posted an ad on Craigslist hoping to find a buyer who would appreciate my car as much as I did. Soon, I was contacted by a man named Mark. Hello, I'm Mark. I saw your ad about the car. Is it still available? He asked over the phone. He was in his early 40s and seemed like a decent person. He told me that he was interested in buying the car for his daughter, who was about to start college. We had a few phone conversations, and everything seemed to be going well. When Mark came for the test drive, he was friendly and showed genuine interest in the car. He inspected every nook and cranny, asked questions, and seemed satisfied with the car's condition. We negotiated the price, and after some back and forth, we agreed on a fair amount. Mark asked me to hold the car for him for two days while he arranged for the payment, and I agreed. Two days later, we met again in a familiar neighborhood. Mark was as friendly as before, and everything seemed to be going according to plan. We took the car for one last test drive, and then it was time for the payment. Mark handed me a cashier's check from Chase Bank. I suggest we go to the bank together to cash the check and transfer the title I suggested. But Mark's demeanor suddenly changed. He became hesitant and seemed nervous. We were parked by the side of the street, discussing the bank visit when Mark asked to inspect the car one more time. I agreed, and as we both stepped out of the car, Mark suddenly jumped back into the driver's seat and sped off, leaving me standing on the sidewalk shocked and confused. Panic surged through me as I watched my car disappear down the street. I turned to the bystanders pleading for someone to call 911. A kind stranger dialed the emergency number, and I quickly explained the situation to the dispatcher. As I was talking, a police car pulled up nearby, and I flagged them down. I got into the back of the police car and gave them all the information I could remember about my car and the man who had stolen it. The officers reassured me that they would do everything they could to find my car, but unfortunately, the thief managed to get away. In the following weeks, I had to deal with the aftermath of the theft. I filed a police report, contacted my insurance company, and tried to come to terms with the loss of my car. I was frustrated and angry with myself for letting my guard down and allowing this to happen. Three months later, just as I was about to receive compensation from my insurance company, I received a call from the police. They had found my car three states away. It turned out that Mark had been part of a car theft ring. He had stolen my car and sold it to another man who had then sold it to an unsuspecting buyer. The police arranged for all of us to meet at the station. The man who had bought my car from the thief agreed to return the car to me and the thief agreed to refund the money to the buyer. In the end, 
I did receive compensation for my car, but the whole ordeal left me feeling stressed and demoralized. Despite this experience, I continued to buy and sell cars on Craigslist. However, I learned a valuable lesson from this incident. Now, I always make sure to take a photo of the buyer's driver's license at the beginning of every meeting. This experience taught me the importance of being cautious and vigilant, especially when dealing with strangers. This happened quite a while back when I was 18 years old. I lived with my folks, even though I had recently moved on from secondary school. I just purchased another PC. Furthermore, after I was finished getting it set up, I posted my old one on Craigslist. It was just two years old. Yet in those days, that implied it was obsolete. It was a Dell PC with fair specs, and it was very nearly 2,000 bucks fresh out of the box. I was asking for just 500 because more current workstations at the time were significantly better. After posting it on the web, I didn't need to wait long for a reaction. A person named Toby informed me I was inspired by the PC, but I needed to see it first. I needed to set up a chance to meet next week when I would be in Midtown. That way we could meet at a bistro or something like that. At the point when I proposed it, Toby said that he wanted it immediately. Therefore I consented to allow him to approach my home. I realized gathering in a public place would be more brilliant. Be that as it may, our home was in suburbia, and I didn't have a vehicle. I realized it was apathetic and moronic. Yet I gave him my residence. My folks weren't home, and I figured it'd be a speedy deal and that nothing would turn out badly. Toby appeared sometime thereafter, on a Saturday at around 7 p.m. I saw a more seasoned van maneuver into the carport, and a man got out. In any case, he was in good company. He had one more person with him. The two of them were no less than 30, a lot greater than me. When that's what I saw, I felt somewhat frightened. Something about their presence felt off. In any case, I forgot about the inclination. All things considered, they were only there to check a PC out. I let them in and we set up in the kitchen. I started showing the PC to Toby and afterward his companion promptly requested that I utilize the restroom. I pointed him to the correct heading, which was not far off and down a short passage. Then at that point I zeroed in on showing the PC to Toby. Around 10 minutes passed while we were checking it out. I had deleted it in advance, so it was fundamentally running as new. Then at that point I unexpectedly understood that the other man hadn't gotten back from the washroom. Hello, he's your companion. Good, I asked Toby. No doubt, you can take some time some of the time, just relax. He consoled me. I tuned in as intently as I could and heard strides that weren't coming from the washroom region. They were coming from higher up. Since there were only the three of us in the house, I realized it was him. The restroom was on the fundamental floor, so there was not a great explanation for him to be up there. That was the point at which I began to overreact inside, however, I attempted to conceal it. I nonchalantly got some information about his companion once more, trusting my anxiety wasn't appearing. His reaction was cold and frightening. He put his hand on my shoulder, not in a well-disposed way, but rather with a ton of strain. He told me not to stress over it. His grasp was fixed agonizingly. Furthermore, at that time I realized this was something other than a deal that turned out badly. We were being ransacked. That was most likely the arrangement all along. Alarm set in that I attempted to keep my poise. I advised Toby to take anything they desired and simply go however, he didn't give up, his grasp on my shoulder felt hard, it resembled danger, what's more I began to shake. I realized I needed to move quickly. I figured out how to split away and arbitrarily my father's office on the primary floor, locking the entryway behind me. I left my telephone on the kitchen table, which was a dumb slip up. Fortunately however, there was a landline in the workplace where I was, so that saved me. My heart was beating as I dialed 911, making sense of the circumstances for the dispatcher. The man is trusting that the police will show up on the longest day of his life. I could hear the two men stepping around the house, most likely taking anything they might find. They probably realized the police were on their way since they took off in no time and cleaned out the front window as they returned to the van on the carport and dashed away. At the point when I was certain they were gone, I emerged to see what was taken. The main things I saw missing on the fundamental floor were the little television in the kitchen and the PC that I was selling. Notwithstanding, I later figured out that a large portion of my mother's gems were taken, as well as no less than $200 in real money. The police appeared around 10 minutes after the burglars left. They remained for some time. 
However, at that point, they left without making any commitments. He was unacceptable. That was the last I heard from the police about what occurred. I contacted them a few times, yet they never hit me up. At the point when my folks and sister returned home, I needed to make sense of what occurred. They generally thought I was kidding from the outset since I have a dull, funny bone. Yet, when they figured out it was genuine, they were distraught as well. I would gauge the misfortunes at around $3,000, which was a tremendous amount of cash for me at that point. Since it was all my issue, I needed to take care of it. That was essentially my entire summer of work down the channel. It was the last time I met an unusual individual off the web. If I was ever to rehash it, there'd be no chance I would allow them to come to my place. It's a public or private arrangement with no exemptions. I use various websites like Craigslist for the same reasons everyone else does. You can find expensive items at significantly discounted prices, or even just cheap things for even cheaper. I don't have a ton of money and using these sites is sometimes essential when it comes to getting things like furniture that's usually really expensive to buy anywhere else. This happened when I was looking around for a dining room table. Ours was really old, and my whole family used it as a place to eat and as a workspace, so it's been through a lot over the years. I went around on Facebook Marketplace and OfferUp, but neither had anything good. Most of them were still expensive, and even when I tried to bargain with a few of the sellers, none of them would budge. So then I went to Craigslist. Around here I think most people use other sites nowadays, but Craigslist still always had the cheapest deals, though they were still somewhat rare to find. But almost as soon as I opened up the site and hit enter on the search bar, a really good listing showed up. It was a very basic wooden dining table that didn't have much wear on it, and the seller posted it for only $100. Compared to the $400, $500 everyone else was listing things for, this was a steal. I sent a message saying I'd love to check it out and would be willing to pay the full price. He didn't reply immediately, so I just took a break and hung out with my kids until around 7 when they went to their rooms to get ready for bed. I went back to my laptop and found a response from just a couple minutes ago. It was a very quick few sentences, saying he was sorry but the table was going to be thrown out tomorrow morning, but if I really wanted it, I'd have to come by tonight or any time before 5 a.m. tomorrow. It was weird that he'd be willing to sell it at any time during the night, and his reasoning didn't make all that much sense to me, but after some thought, I replied back saying I could pick it up right now. I didn't want to go there really late into the night, or super early in the morning, but it was only 7, so I didn't see a problem if I was able to go right now. The man replied quickly, agreeing and sending the address. It was only 10 minutes from my place. So I let my wife know what was going on and where I'd be, then headed out. From context clues, you probably already know that I don't live in a lavish area. So when I say the seller's house was really worn down, I mean it was really worn down. It was small like the others in our area, but the yard was full of trash and random other things, was surrounded by a thin chain link fence. I parked on the side and opened the fence walking through the yard and up to the door, which was already open. I could hear some people talking and laughing. I peeked inside and gave a light knock on the door. Right away, a man came around the corner and invited me in. He looked like he was in late college, somewhere in his mid-twenties. As I stepped inside, though, I couldn't help but notice how disgusting the whole place was. There were beer cans laying around and stains in the carpet. It looked like a really poorly taken care of house where they had probably hosted hundreds of college parties. The man was very laid back though, casually walking me down the hallway and into the kitchen while talking about how he didn't have room for the table anymore. When we got to the kitchen, there were two other men looking about the same age and standing against the wall, seemingly in the middle of a conversation. Next to them was the table, somehow it looked almost untouched. I didn't know how that was possible considering the rest of the house. I walked around it and checked to see if it was stable and whatnot, but as I did, the house suddenly went quiet. The two talking had stopped and the man selling the table didn't speak either. I looked up, seeing them all staring at me. Did I do something I asked, looking around at each of them? When my eyes fell on one of the men closest to me though, I noticed that his pupils were massive, something that only being drugged up could achieve, but what he was on I didn't know. Regardless, in that moment, I knew this wasn't right. Not only was this getting strange, but I didn't want to buy a table that's been in this kind of house and used by these sorts of people. Um, I think I'm going to pass on it. Thank you, though, I said softly. I started walking toward the hallway, but one of them stepped in front of me. He didn't say anything. He just stood there, blocking the way out. 
Something about the way they were all looking and acting. I could tell that whatever this was, was planned out, and they likely never meant to sell the table. My face fell to fear, as the anticipation of just standing there, surrounded by these strangers, began to overwhelm me. But then one of them stepped over and whispered something in the other's ear, and they moved aside, still not saying anything. I cautiously walked between them, hurrying down the hallway and out the door. A lot of things went through my head on the drive home. I knew that they were planning something horrible, but what that was and why they ended up letting me go, I'm not so sure of. When I got home, I told my wife, who convinced me to call the police and report it, but they couldn't do anything without anything having happened. So whatever those men were planning, I'll probably never know. I just hope someone else doesn't have to find out. I wanted to move out of my old apartment in a few months and was hoping to get some money to help pay for movers. The shoes were nothing special, but I listed them for generous prices, hoping to get them bought quickly. It was some guy whose email had the name John K in it and he offered just $5 less than my listing price. It seemed like an unnecessary adjustment to the original price, but I didn't want to keep waiting for more offers, so I wrote him back saying I was okay with that. We set up to meet the following day at five in the parking lot of a public gas station in the middle of town. The next day I sent a text and he confirmed that he was on his way, so I left as well and got to the gas station right at five. They weren't there yet, but there was a lot of traffic on the road, so I figured he'd be late. I sat in my car patiently, and over the course of 30 minutes, the roads cleared up and the sun started coming down, and then John finally pulled in. He drove a small sedan with none of the headlights working and resembling something from a scrapyard. He parked next to me and got out. John looked like he was in his 30s and was a pretty large guy, wearing ripped up clothes and having long, unkempt hair. He didn't say much, so I brought out the shoes and let him look at them. As he held them though and didn't say anything, he kept looking back at the gas station. I don't know what he was looking at, I thought, but after he checked over his shoulder multiple times, I glanced over as well. The gas station was empty aside from one guy putting gas in his car, but otherwise I didn't know what he could be looking at. John was taking his time though, pointlessly looking over everything multiple times, as if they were some really rare shoes that he was going to drop hundreds on, but these were just some regular sneakers, nothing fancy or rare. Then John looked over his shoulder one more time, came just as the car by the pump started to drive away, and all of a sudden, his whole demeanor changed. He stopped looking at the shoes and looked at me. What else do you have, he asked abruptly. I looked at him confused. Those are the only shoes I brought. I didn't know you were interested in others. His eyes went cold as he stepped past me and put his hand on my car door, trying to open it. It was locked, I explained. John immediately looked at me and told me to unlock it. His voice was deep and strict, like it was a threat if I didn't. I kind of just stared at him and tried to wrap my head around this, thinking of what the best course of action would be, but in the moment, there's just no time to really think through options. I unlocked the door, knowing at most all he could take was a couple random bills I had in the front, but then he said something that I was not expecting at all. Get in, he opened the passenger door and told me again. I stood there, even more taken aback but now starting to get way more worried about where this was going. I looked behind me, hoping someone else was here, but the gas station was empty. No people or cars anywhere in sight. John grabbed my arm and pulled me over to the door, taking the keys from me and aggressively shoving me into the car while throwing a few punches landing on the right side of my face. I immediately tried to get up, but John slammed the door against my head, making my vision go blurry and everything just sort of fading in and out. I heard him start walking around the car as if he was going to the driver's side, but then he suddenly turned around and sprinted back to his truck. I was still out of it and barely remember anything else, but I guess someone pulled in at the perfect time and confronted John, scaring him away. If they hadn't have helped me and John was able to get in and presumably drive away, I don't know what would have happened. Assuming his car was either stolen or untraceable to his name, then stealing my car and abducting me would have left no trace of our interaction giving him days, if not weeks, to do whatever it was he planned before anyone would even come looking. I used to frequently purchase iPhones, video game systems, TVs, and many other items on Facebook Marketplace, then resell them on Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace to make a profit. I've been doing this for years as a side job, and I've learned a lot along the way. 
Hello, I'm Mark. I saw your ad about the car. Is it still available? I usually try to resell iPhones because they seem to have the highest profit margin. On one occasion, I got an iPhone 10 for $155. This was over a year ago, so it was a very good deal. You'd be surprised how low the prices you can negotiate from these people if you try. Most people might reject such ridiculous offers, but many just want quick cash, and they'll sell it to the first person who contacts them. So I took full advantage of it. Anyway, I had listed that iPhone 10 for sale at $300, and I wrote in the description that I would consider best offers. Usually, this phone sells quickly, so I wasn't too worried about rejecting offers less than $300, because most of the time, I could sell it within a week at the original price if I just waited. Just an hour after I posted the listing, someone contacted me who was interested in the phone. Hi, I'm interested in the iPhone. Can we meet tomorrow? They asked a few questions and planned to meet the next day in the late afternoon after they got off work. A few hours before the meeting, they messaged me and asked if I could come directly to their house instead of meeting at Walmart like we had planned before. I was immediately wary of that request, but I still asked them for their address so I could put it into the GPS app on my phone to see how far it was. They were only about 20 minutes away, which wasn't too far actually, and they were willing to pay the full $300 for the phone. So I decided to go for it. I told them I could deliver the phone to their house, and that was fine. I just told them to let me know what time I should come. They thanked me excessively and kept telling me how I was a lifesaver and how grateful they were to me for helping them. They then asked if I could come at 7.30 p.m. and they would definitely be home by then. I agreed, but I didn't like that they wanted to meet so late. I had to get up for work the next morning at 5 a.m., and I like to have some alone time at home and get some time to myself before I have to sleep. When they initially said we could meet after they got off work, they said late afternoon. So I expected it to be between 4.30 to 6 p.m., maybe at the latest. But I still went along with it because I really wanted to sell the phone. This woman didn't live in a neighborhood. She lived on a street off the main road in town. She definitely had neighbors, but the area had a somewhat rural feel to it. Around 7.20 p.m., I left because I wanted to make sure she would be there when I arrived. I told her when I was on my way and that I would arrive in about 20 minutes. When I arrived and knocked on the door, my anxiety tripled, waiting for an answer. It was starting to get dark, so that didn't help much. When the woman opened the door, she introduced herself as Sabrina, she invited me in and introduced me to her husband, who was sitting on the couch in the living room. Almost immediately, they started mocking me, making fun of my clothes and appearance, and even tried to pass it off as a joke. But I sensed strong passive aggression almost immediately after I walked in. I had a strange feeling about these people. There was something very wrong about them. I thought Sabrina might be on drugs because she was acting weird and she looked like someone who was using something. And I'm not talking about weed. I'm talking about serious hard drugs. Her eyes looked sunken, and she was pale as a corpse. She was definitely on something. Trust me. She just wasn't acting right. Not like a normal person. Anyway, she was rude and somewhat pushy while I was there and argued with her husband about how much she was willing to pay for the phone. I let them look at the phone. Sabrina wanted to put her SIM card into the phone before buying it because she wanted to make sure the phone would work. She then started complaining about a small crack on the phone, even though I stated in the description that there was a small crack and it was fully visible in the photos I took. She started getting upset and said that I was trying to scam her. She said she wouldn't pay more than $200 for it. I immediately said no and asked for the phone back, constantly trying to negotiate, and I said that I wouldn't accept less than $250.
I made it very clear that I wouldn't accept anything less than that. Not liking that at all, she took her SIM card back from the phone and literally threw it towards me. And I mean she really threw it at me like really hard. The phone hit me directly in the face and then fell to the floor after bouncing from my head to the hardwood floor. What's wrong with you? I asked. Then she ran off somewhere. I think it was her bedroom. I started screaming and crying hysterically. Her husband tried to calm me down and gave me $100 so I wouldn't call the police. I accepted the $100 and I didn't call. One day, I was browsing Craigslist out of sheer boredom. I wasn't looking for anything specific, and at that time I didn't even know that people used Craigslist for dating or meeting new people, and making friends or anything like that. But after doing some research, I found out that it definitely exists. I was very bored and quite lonely, so I started looking through the listings. There was a guy named Tom, who was very handsome. He said he was 32 years old. I myself was 34 years old at the time, so we were around the same age. I wasn't looking for anything specific, I'm a very laid back person, so I usually just go with the flow of whatever happens. He had a good aura, and seemed like a genuine person. And he also wasn't too pushy, so I wasn't too worried about the scam situation. He was clearly attractive though, and I liked everything about his profile, so I gave him a chance. Hi, I'm Tom. Nice to meet you. We started talking, and eventually, he got my phone number. We talked for a few days through text messages, and calls this also turned out to be positive, because he lived less than 10 minutes from where I lived. He asked if I wanted to go out that weekend to the nearest bar on Saturday. I said yes, and we continued to talk. Everything progressed quickly and we very quickly moved from friendly conversation to very flirtatious conversation. On our first date at the bar, when we met on Saturday, everything went well. We talked casually, got a bit drunk, had good food, and I had a lot of fun. I definitely liked this guy, and I had feelings for him. Then, towards the end of the night, just before we were about to part ways, I got a message from a random number saying, and I quote, Stay away from my man. You better not be there with him when I get there. I was very confused. I showed him the message I received. He dismissed it as if it were irrelevant, and he didn't know what or who it was. Then he became very awkward and started acting suspicious, like he wanted to leave right away. Just before we were about to part ways, his girlfriend showed up. Yes, I said his girlfriend. He had a girlfriend this whole time. I was quite angry, and I had been drinking, so I didn't hold back from this woman at all. She started screaming at him and calling me various names and saying rude things to me. I started shouting back at her, and I guess she didn't like it because she actually took off her shoe and threw it in my direction. Then she started attacking me with her bag and hitting me, pulling my hair, and beating me up badly. What are you doing with my man? You home wrecker. I tried to defend myself by grabbing her hair, but before I could, I fell to the ground and hit my head on the concrete. I had to go to the hospital because I was almost unconscious. That night was a big mistake. I still can't believe I was ever in that situation in the first place. I'm a very calm, friendly and polite person, so the whole thing was very out of character for me, if you will. I didn't even know how she found out about us, or even how she knew we were at the bar together. I'm glad she found out before I got too involved with this guy, and got more heartache than I already got. She eventually got arrested that night and charged with assault. I walked away without any charges or time in jail at all. I just went away with a severe concussion, and a big reminder of why I'll never meet random strangers from the internet again. I now have a fiancé we've been together for over five years and we're getting married next year we plan to start a family soon and i've never been happier this is just one of the stories i like to tell when warning people about the dangers of the internet and meeting unknown strangers you never know what someone's true intentions could be 
Things could have been much worse for me that night.